Dear friends, I'm glad to see you all on Vegan Life. It's Saturday, 18th of June, 10 p.m. Give time, one minute, minute past 10, day 115 with Alexei Rostovich. Glad to see you, Alexei. A hundred thousand people are watching us, as usual. I am addressing these people that, regardless that it's a weekend, you know what to do. Please share. And of course, subscribe to Fagin Life, Alexei Rostovich. And if you're watching that in English, do not forget to subscribe to the Privateer Station. All right. The mic is yours. Um, we don't have significant changes. We're still fighting in the same areas. North of Kharkov, in Izum area. Well, let's put it this way. The main areas of pressure is from Izum to Slavyansk and from, Pas from Papasna to Bakhmut, trying to cut uh, Bakhmut Serdanetsk road. They actually reached the road there, got their asses handed to them and uh, returned back. But they're pretty close to the road anyway. And the fact is that we're not really using this road for a long time already and we use different routes to supply. There are also fights to the north east of Severodonetsk. They're also trying to go to Pokrovska and Severodonetsk. We're showing the map of uh, Severodonetsk fighting. It's that protrusion on the right side at three o'clock at Severodonetsk and Papasna is coming from the south trying to cut that off. Also, no much to report on uh, Zaporozhye and on Kherson, France. From the meaningful things, it is important to look at what's happening with the artillery fight. During the last 24 hours, we destroyed at least seven serious munition depots on the Russian side, uh, on the occupied side, and each of them had at least a thousand uh, different uh, munition caliber items, and they exploded for several hours. So that pisses them off, and they were hitting Dnipro, uh, they were hitting Kharkov. They try to either reach, shoot up some of the repair facilities for the military or blow up some of the refineries and gas uh, and oil centers. And the usual, they are not too accurate. So whenever Russian missiles fly, a bunch of them misses the target and they did hit a bunch of civilians in Kharkov and there are dead and wounded. The usual, we're hitting military targets, trying to be very precise, and they're just hitting in the direction of... The, the intent is to hit our fuel supply centers, and yet the radius of their hit is different, and they're not too shy about hitting everything. We try to be very accurate and not damage anything civil in the vicinity of a military target, and the Russian side does not really care uh, if their strike might uh, kill a number of civilians. They really are not shy, do not shy away from it. Mm -hmm. All right, so a question about Kharkov. Do you think the situation has not changed from the beginning and the threat to this city still does not exist? There is a real threat to Kharkov, actually, in Belgrade region, in Russia, they have accumulated about five or seven battalion tactical groups, which, if thrown on our territory, can give uh, a lot of difficult moments for Kharkov. They are not forced enough to capture the city, but they can get closer to it, put some field artillery and uh, shoot it up. They also have a blend, a mix of uh, different aviation, about six storm fighters and about 10, 12 uh, interceptors, so uh, jet fighters, so they can use that. And Kharkov is still 
a border city. There was a time, remember, when we got to the border and captured, recaptured the territory. Now we had to withdraw a little. And uh, they are pretty close to the city, so they can reach it with a field, uh, with a long-range field artillery already. But yeah, military management, military command knows about it. We're working with the situation. Um, you can just we cannot be strong everywhere. So if we're using force some other place, we cannot have overwhelming position near Kharkov. Um, so citizens of Kharkov. Uh, please be on the lookout for the sirens. It is real. And uh, last night they actually were hit with Iskandar missiles from Belgorod region. So there is a definite level of threat there. All right. Is it, uh, do you think it's an attempt to distract from Severodonetsk and Lysychansk and uh, road to Bakhmut? Is it still the dis diversion? Or is it now a new plan? It is very logical and cruel military story. While we are tiring Russian forces from Severodonetsk to basically all the way there on the Eastern Front, we are also slowly creeping up to Kherson. We are hitting them with one hand and creeping up to them with another. And they're doing the similar thing with Kharkov. And we'll see what happens. It's war. So you have enough uh, forces to protect Kharkov, right? Because, you know, if you trade your son from Kharkov, yeah, no, 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 they will not capture Kharkov. We have enough garrison there to defend the city. But the bad thing is that they it will still be within reach of the artillery and they will be shelling it with uh, whatever they have. So people living in Kharkov need to be very careful and understand that they are a frontline city again, which at this point is just a figure of speech because they're, they've been shelled with artillery for over a week already. It's more for those who did not live there so that the whole country understood what's happening. All right, got it. Uh, we're live for eight minutes. And now let's look at Izum area. There is an attempt from the west to cut them off, right? Well, yeah, we're moving. It, this movement is with battles. It's not free. We slow pro, slowly progress. And according to the statements of our general command, we're following Siversky Donetsk towards the Zoom, causing all kinds of trouble and also looking for different options to block their attempts to cross the river. We know what we're doing. Um, it's unknown how successful it will be. We don't know details of uh, how much of the force uh, is there for at least available for the public. And I mean, we military people know, but it's not to be disclosed. So, but there are no news on both Izum or uh, Kharkov and Kherson. There is not news north and south. Means yeah, that usually means that uh, armies are regrouping and getting more reserves. And yet there is some motion near Lysychansk in that area. So I will say that this will progress to certain goals and completions. Uh, when Monday comes, we'll miss tomorrow, which is Sunday. Um, we'll get news by Monday. And those people who watch us daily understand that some days are very rich with information like yesterday, others are not so, and that's when the tactical pause happens, the sides are bringing more troops, more ammo, rethinking their strategy, and that's when I have to use the words I'm using now, that there is the same strategy, there is regrouping, but two days is a lot, so in two days we'll have news, something of notion will happen. All right, thank you.
and let's look at the side questions that uh, people keep asking that of course affect the front line and the flow of war so the visit of Macron, Schultz and Draghi is over they visited Kiev and left after them there was Boris Johnson but upon their return their rhetoric is slowly drifting towards uh, there is no other alternative we need to sit down and negotiate with Kremlin and Putin so the question is in your opinion maybe in the opinion of your surroundings and the immediate vicinity of president what is the next perspective for the Italian peace plan or its uh, implementation there is none is that page completely flipped that's the question at the very least it is pushed away to a certain level with a certain level of success on our side I don't think it's actual anymore because the further you go and even the West understands that that Russia needs to suffer a military defeat here well Schultz and Macron are saying something else and Macron is saying that peace is softer and they're saying yes uh, it'll conclude with negotiations but Ukraine will be in the position of power when Ukraine will be able to dominate these negotiations but what are the conditions for Ukraine to dominate um, they are not saying that but for us it's obvious the only way for us to dominate is when we kick Putin's butt and people in with common sense in the world to understand that including Schultz and Draghi the other thing is that you need to show what you can do in Ukraine so we can believe you but since Russian army still has the battle potential significant one and we're not at our level where we can counter launch a counteroffensive full scale so there'll be some time before that emerges and we'll get we'll get to certain steps either Russians get to Severodonetsk or we get to Kherson um, we'll reach our goals and then maybe we'll reach our goal several times faster and several times more effective than Russia it's just a bit of a slow process right now because it uh, since we do not have overwhelming support and weapons and uh, cannot really match Russians one for one it takes time for us to accumulate effort and resource and then push through when the armies like ours and Russians are fighting when we are the armies of basically the same level like three and a half and four levels then one cannot demonstrate a quick success another story is when two armies of level five and level three are fighting say United States and Iraq then yeah you could and even then they took them some time but the tempo was really fast and you could see how army of uh, level five is much better than level three in our case it's three and a half with 3.8 or something but you know you if you look at their plans they had a plan to go in two days for about 250 kilometers reality is showing that they cannot really progress or take the same parking lot in Severodonetsk for over a month already so it's literally the question of accumulating more forces and pushing and pressing the opponent out of a certain territory all right so let's set the Western Europe aside um, Mark I want to say one important thing one should not take these statements as final all the politics it will be changing depending upon the situation on the battlefront and us and the Russian side are working on changing that situation on the front from different directions but we both work with that field and just don't think that it's a constant there's political stance of Western Europe you know we used to think that if Western Europe or 
following certain peace accords uh, had promised us something that cannot be changed. This is not the case anymore. It's the active war that shouldn't have happened in the first place, if the first sentiment was real. Uh, but for now, it's really up to us to change things on the battlefront. And their position probably will stay to a degree that eventually you'll still need to sit down and find peace. But this is a much wider umbrella, because it could incorporate us uh, winning on this war again. And it can also incorporate, you know, negative and positive outcomes for us. Negative when we lose territories and positive when we get territories back. Uh, because Russian Federation would run out of resources. We're just on our side, we don't really have a choice. If we lose, the rest of Ukraine turns into a big butcher. And that is where the story from Britain comes very handy, that they will pre be preparing our infantry. And it's a slow process, but yeah, you know, when you realize that this rain is not a brief one, you need to prepare accordingly. Now, I got a news today, Insider posted that Serdikov was fired, one of the Russian generals. The head of uh, airborne troops was uh, forcibly resigned from his position. So there are not many details, but how would you gauge their losses? Oh, they, they suffered tremendous losses because the plan was to use them to capture things real fast. And they were thrown right there. They actually, remember I told that uh, they called our restaurants and said that they'll be coming uh, put the tables out for a thousand people will be coming in a day. So our restorators already called them back and said, they also have a sense of humor, called back and said, so when you're coming, we're ready. Um, battalion level forces in Russia suffered about 60% and most of them lost their golden core, commander of battalion, commander of brigade, prepared people who basically serve as an important link between the field and the management. And this is the golden reserve of each army. Uh, and the airborne troops, they suffered tremendously. They lost, some of them lost all of that level command. And 76th Division from Pskov suffered most, but many others also felt the pain. Okay, well, we'll see if that information gets the confirmation. Uh, even, even the Marines, the Special Forces, everything that were thrown first, they had big issues. They lost a lot of people. Even the lead groups like Almaz, like today, they threw them forward for a certain operation. They lost seven people, didn't come back. So, and it's a very super highly trained elite people. So they keep losing. And today there was another information that we covered the command post with possible death of two generals. Again, no rush. We need to verify and report later. This is so far just a preliminary data. Another block of questions some people are asking regarding Ukraine visas with Russia. I always rooted for that. It would have been much easier if Ukraine and Russia had uh, usual visa relations. And of course, uh, there are Russians who support Ukraine, who resist the power in Russia. Some of them leave the country, left for the West, others left for Ukraine. So, how do you think these questions will be solved? Do you think they get they can get visas to Ukraine? 
or they can get access to Ukraine. Yeah, I think they will. And by the way, I need to say that we have a huge influx to the Legion Free Russia, Freedom of Russia. How many? Oh, there are over several hundred already. In the last few days, they added another 250 people. Are these Russians who came? Yeah, these are Russians who come here through third countries from Russia. And it's interesting that it happened. We'll figure it out. It literally increased in terms of a few days. And now it's kind of at its capacity. So we're talking about duplicating or creating a second legion. And also, one needs to understand that visa regime doesn't mean closed borders. It means that the uh, Ukrainian side will have it a little easier to check and refuse entry to unwanted elements. Visa is not uh, is not a prohibition. It just gives us a better opportunity to look at every single person who comes and uh, protect the country from possible elements that can cause harm and trouble for the country. Those people who have uh, history, who have uh, roots, recommendations, I, I'm, I'm sure they'll be getting visas without issue. All right, that's logical. Then the next question. third parties, which are allies to Ukraine, also add visa regimes. So Lithuania, which uh, used to serve as a transit country for Russian communications with uh, Kaliningrad, they also introduced visa mode that now everything going to Kaliningrad, need, uh, going through Lithuania needs a visa. So all these um, things like Kaliningrad and Pridnestrovia, they're very specific. You can only get there by air. No, you can also get there by sea. Yes, true, you can get there by sea. But it is a more sophisticated logistics operation, more difficult. So in general, the whole story with Russian isolation, you know, ships don't come to their ports. Do you know if it evolves anywhere? Are there any perspectives for Russian Federation to lose more communication with the outer world. So there are two kinds of sanctions that are very difficult to push through, transport and energy. Although there is some success there, McFall here, Mark already reported that 48% uh, of sanctions planned have already been implemented. Um, also energy and transport are two fundamental um, backbones of our civilization, so it is much difficult to limit and stop that. And yet Gazprom is still lowering the energy supply, they lowered by 12% to Germany, by 15 to Italy. I think here it will be a situation of a slow accumulation of issues. Uh, where it will get a lot of a pile of things compiled together and then one last straw will break it. So, for example, Kaliningrad blockade that makes it more expensive for Russia to supply that region and their logistical opportunities are being used by need to supply Kaliningrad. Uh, that means that they will not be able to use that to support uh, their military in Belarus or in Ukraine. That means that some of the airplanes, some of the logistical lines will be diverted to Kaliningrad. And that helps us here on the front. And that's overall how it happens. A step here, a little there. That's how situation changes. This war, I will almost want to call it a drip war. They're dripping their actions. We are dripping our counteractions. And we're fighting as we can, you know. By the way, polit Politico, uh, U.S. Uh, publication, issued the news that they might give us four more HIMARS uh, MLRS systems. 
60 kilometers, which is significantly to say. Uh, four of them can affect about 400 kilometers of the front. That's a very good story. Thank you. And this is not land lease, right? This is uh, US resources outside of it. Yes, land lease will start happening later. American help is uh, subdivided into two major blocks. First is uh, decisions made by US president who can provide immediate aid by decree. And the second is land lease program, which gets finance and uh, works on a bigger scale, has a bigger program. So that will happen later. It's not working yet. It's still going through its own logistical circles. This is just what presidents uh, send us. And land lease is yet to come, which is very hopeful news for us and uh, not so hopeful, very sad news for uh, Russian command. Um, I'll summarize a few things to kind of show people how to think militarily, politic in politics and military areas. In a week, we had phenomenal success of Ukraine artillery. We're hitting ammo depots, fat targets, command posts. What happened? Right? So something changed. Better equipment. Yes, better equipment, probably better targeting, better spotting. And you have some foreign aid with spotting. Technologies, yes. So not everything is so visible. For example, they supplied 10 howitzers. Doesn't seem like much, but 10 with radars and with uh, special complications for anti-artillery fight. They are equal 40 of Russians. So normal civilians would not know the difference, but it's our role to actually bring these news out. So we can say that, yes, something happened and the effectiveness of our artillery grew exponentially in the last week. So sometimes it's not measured in the artillery weapon itself. It also is measured in support and spotting and targeting and all that. And eventually it starts to affect the situation on the battlefront. Let's go back to sanctions. Um, summer started with uh, a push for the peace talk. Um, that sixth set of sanctions took a while to agree upon. Personal uh, sanctions were disputed to a degree, but uh, ended up with even Patriarch uh, Kirill from Russia getting on one of the lists in Britain. Um, for now, it seems like as we're going deep into summer, there is some slowing down on the sanctions front. Now, you've talked about the commission of uh, your Mark McFall. Do you think there'll be an opportunity for intensification on that line? Well, you need to understand that uh, the interest of this war is low right now. First of all, because the war lasts since February. Second, it's summer. Summer is always a decrease in interest, it's a political pause all over the world, vacations and personal life, we understand that. Third, objectively on the front, there are no bright operative successes that could have scared the West uh, to a stance, oh, sure, let's give them more weapons because they've lost, let's say, Severodonetsk or Lysychansk, or it could have uh, delighted them, look, they got Kherson and Dizum, Let's give them more weaponry. They seem to be a good uh, handling it well. So, until the big success of the sides in the front, that situation will not change much. Re uh, regarding McFall Yermak Commission, they work according to the plan. And it is accessible only to professionals who are following them very closely. So the group uh, FATF that monitors uh, money laundering and terrorist uh, financial activity around the world, they acknowledge today that uh, Russian actions in Ukraine, in Ukraine uh, make Russia uh, an offender and the country that cannot participate in this organization, it cannot affect their expert uh, estimates, they cannot affect their management and strategic decisions, 
So this seems like a small thing for a layman, but no, 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 FATF is a serious organization. Oh yeah, that's why we're here, Fagan and Aristovich are showing the whiteboard to explain what it is. FATF is a very serious organization. It's not uh, a bright piece of news like, uh, you know, we did not uh, hit a command outpost or did not take any other town back. But in essence, this is one of those news that are slowly cutting the lifeline out of Putin's regime. Upon the accumulation of things like that, that's when this regime falls. Switzerland also joined European sanctions, the sixth uh, package. Also, seems not to be a big deal, but Switzerland is not a simple country, it is definitely not a usual country in terms of financial flows. Also, if Kremlin limits the gas supply to Italy and Germany uh, for 15, 12, 20 percent, they're kind of sanctioning themselves as well. Also, it's summer, so there's not the demand is not high for energy, and also people are a little tired with war, they're focusing on other things. As autumn comes, there's a new political season starting, and it'll go come into motion all over the world because there'll be new politicians, new political ambitions to punish, to solve, to aid. Or this can also be changed if one of the sides starts moving and changing the situation on the front before the end of summer. But it seems like Russian side will not do, be able to do that because in most of their detachments they have 30 to 40 percent people refusing to fight. And up to 50 percent of their detachments have very old weaponry. So it basically shows that the Russian side is losing its battle worthiness and capacity to win and fight longer. So there'll be a time when the situation will change and we'll start moving forward and freeing, liberating our cities and encircling and uh, surrendering Russian troops. Those would be bright news that people will uh, get their information and attention fix uh, listening to that. But for now it's a pause, somewhat of a pause period, and everything will come back to a movement again soon. It's just a, the nature of it, it's a cycle. Well, that's understandable. People very often want things to conclude, do some determination about the war, and stop that situation. Of course, real life is always different from these wishes. Uh, citizens from Kharkov texting me, why are you scaring us, why are you scaring the city? I'm not trying to scare you, just trying to impress on you that you should not have illusions, especially about having children living in the city right now. Uh, so you have to beware. On the other hand, you had a much worse situation before. We're not talking about that. And our command is not also uh, sitting and waiting till Russians approach the city closer. We're taking other countermeasures. I personally have a lot of relatives in Kharkov. It is not an alien city for me. And I'm just giving a heads up that it's a frontline city, so whenever you hear the siren, duck, treat it seriously, and then make your own decision if you need to leave the city and move your family to a safer place, or if you decide to stay there for now. I'm ready to say many times that Russian army has no capacity to take city, they can't even come to the outskirts of the city, but there is danger to live in that area because they'll be shelling everything they can reach. All right, we've been live for 35 minutes. Let's give a pause and I'll remind you that we're continuing our charity program. There's a barcode on the screen. We accept digital 
artwork, digital donations from artists. Please mail it to Fagan at uh, FaganLive gmail.com um, actually fagin live at gmail.com <clears throat> another piece of news that the head of Kherson region said that uh, the capture of the region because uh, was made possible because Russia uh, had a second in military command of the region Igor Sadokhin who gave Russia the maps of minefields and coordinated uh, Russian activities by phone. Um, that guy was uh, imprisoned by us back in March. Then president fired the head of the security, Ukrainian security service in the area, Sergei Kruvaruchko. It's an impossible thing happening in Ukraine. We are starting to name actually responsible people because our public contract is that there are no guilty sites. So that usually means that everybody is guilty and there is a degree of uh, disagreement in the society. Whenever you don't have guilty people, everybody will be guilty. Um, and that's what I was trying to explain to the upper management and president. Seems like uh, they're learning some things and that's the first serious move, so hopefully not the last. All right. I request from different people from chat invite Takayev to Kiev. Takayev is in a difficult situation. Maybe we should not be inviting him to Kiev and setting him up. Well, he is a member, his country is a member of uh, DKB, the defense organization with Russia. He needs to draw the line. I think he, he knows it better. In my opinion, it's just a figure of speech. I'm not giving him advice. I'm not recommending anything to him or Kazakh people. It'll be too bold for me to do that. But it'll be prudent to draw a very thin line between their position with China and with Russia. And I think he did that on the St. Petersburg Forum pretty well. I think he will manage brilliantly. Kazakh people support us, they feel us, they feel our pain because Ukraine was practiced in Kazakhstan just a little while ago uh, by the Russian side and it seems like on the level of uh, Russian statements they do understand that too. Yeah, some of the Russian propagandists were moderating that uh, Petersburg Forum, they saw that statement, they saw the picture they see the writing on the wall with the Kazakhstan position. And I think Kazakhstan and Ukraine will always be friendly. We'll find ways to cooperate. So tomorrow, I understand, we'll have a break. Yes, it is a break tomorrow. We'll have a different show. We'll have Gennady Gitkov. Another person from Russia who is in opposition to the regime. We'll talk about uh, St. Petersburg Forum. I had insiders texting me and sending videos and sending pictures of uh, sex workers they hired. There was like a whole escort troop working there of both sexes, by the way, both sexes. They throw expletives at other people, but it's very sophisticated uh, entertainment sphere in uh, Russia. Anyway, um, please... Uh, participate in the help program. The barcode is on the bottom left on the screen. We sent the uh, last amount of money to the widow of a uh, Ukrainian officer and we're looking for the next uh, grantee for that program. It's a bit difficult. Uh, the stock ex that uh, trade platform OpenSea and the funny tr money transfers so we're working the logistics of it. It's co somewhat complicated, but please come join. Alexei, see you after tomorrow. Goodbye. See you.